speaker is Rachel Painter, and I want to say that Rachel's parents, Ken and Karen, are here to listen to this. So Rachel was advised, is being advised by professors Karen Miller and postdoc uh, Cindy Lukianenko. Uh, she went to Granada, her, and her major is in communication science and disorders, and she's going to be talking to us about to Spanish acquisition of variable clinic placement. And just so that you know, we're going to test you at the end. <laughs> <laughs> just a side note on why my parents are here. Yes, they came to see me, but I also thought it was a brilliant idea to get us a puppy my senior year of um, undergraduate. So they're taking the puppy home for this week so I can finish my applications for graduate school. So, <laughs> yay, parents. <laughs> They're the best, right? <laughs> um, so I did focus on L2 Spanish acquisition of variable clinic placement. Um, I was an undergrad in Granada, Spain. Uh, so we just had heard Maggie talk about variable um, phonetic cue, so we're going to kind of follow in there. I'm going to talk about variable word order. So we know that variable forms are two or more forms that can alternate but don't change the meaning of an utterance. So language has many variable forms um, that can be constrained by a linguistic factor, such as maybe something lexical, which would mean the words coming next in the sentence, or something like a social factor, such as SES, which would be like working class versus middle class, gender, and age. So we know that Spanish clinic placement is variable, and it is also, also lexically constrained. So when we were putting this project together, together one of the big questions um, that we looked at is, how do adult L2 learners acquire this variable linguistic pattern? So before I get started, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is a clinic um, in English, which is my native language. Um, we don't have clinics, we just have regular pronouns, um, such as it. Um, so Spanish clinic pronouns are weak, unstressed pronouns, um, and unlike full pro pronouns in English, um, they can't be used in isolation, modified, or conjoined. Um, so I have some examples here. Um, I am not, I'm not very fluent in Spanish, so uh, Chris, if you hear me say a sentence in Spanish, no big blame. I'm learning. So um, here's an example of a proclitic sentence, uh, la niña lo quiere comprar, so that translates into the girl wants to buy it. Uh, lo is the clitic here in this sentence, um, and it's going before the finite verb, querer. And then in the second one here, this is an end clitic sentence, la niña quiere comprar lo. You can see the clitic um, is at the end of the sentence, making it inclusive. You can see in English, they both translate to the exact same meaning, and they're both um, grammatically correct as well. So inclusive is most like, um, native uh, or English, um, we put our um, pronouns at the end of a sentence, and as you can see here, taking it after the finite verb would fall most in line with um, our English. So many researchers um, are interested in this vari variable positioning of clinics and what factors actually influence this placement. Um, there's a Davies Corpus uh, data study um, from 1995 that looked at this variability over, uh, across many variabilities and uh, um, different types of Spanish from all over the world. And he found that there are factors, um, such as the finite verb, the animacy of the referent, the type of clinic and clinic function, that actually cause a favor, or cause a speaker to favor the proclitic or enclitic positioning. So these are the six verbs that we chose um, to include in my study here. Um, this is the percent of the time in the proclitic position from the Davies Corpus data study. So for example, let's take uh, ear a from the finite verb, uh, to go. 86% of the time, um, Davies found that it was used in the proclitic positioning. So that means that we're more likely to hear a sentence like Sabado, Teresa, Loba, a comprar, and la libria, in the proclitic position, than a sentence like por la tarde, Jorge, va a buscarlo, por todos lados, where you see the clitic in the enclitic position. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have something like Perfurier, with only 18% um, favoring proclitic position. So let's talk about our L2 learners, um, classroom versus immersion. Like Spanish classes um, here on Penn State's campus, um, L2 students do learn that clinics are grammatical constructs and can freely vary before or after the finite verb. So what that means is um, they learn that they can place that clinic before the verb or after the verb, and the sentence is going to mean the exact same thing. It's also going to be grammatical either way. So, but we know the case, we know that it's actually the case that native Spanish speakers show a preference for this proclitic and enclitic positioning, and it is contextually um, dependent. We also know from other researchers that uh, children in Spanish master this variability pretty early on. 
So like the researcher Giesling, our research kind of goes in line here that we're working to understand how L2 speakers master this variation that's not taught in the classroom and what immersion has to do with it. So with that in mind, we move into my research questions. Um, with L2 Learns in Spanish, we may see differences in their variable clinic usage based on their length of exposure and their fluency level. So our first uh, question has to do with our monolingual native speakers. Um, do they show these same variable clinic patterns in usage as the other varieties of Spanish that Davies found? Um, in particular, do they favor uh, procle proclesis or an ear ah construct and inclusis for something like tener k? And then do partier and care carrier, sorry, kind of fall right in the middle. So the second question is, do LT speakers of brief and long immersion um, show these same patterns, and what does their proficiency level and their length of immersion have to do with their productions? So I split my um, participants up into two groups. I had 20 native speakers in Granada and 17 L2 speakers. It was actually a lot tougher than I uh, thought to find my 17 L2 speakers. Um, running around Granada and not speaking very fluent Spanish. I do have to thank Rebecca, Chris, and Maggie for helping me with my Spanish. So, but I'm very proud of my 17 L2 speakers, the best. <laughs> so students who are in Granada for less than one year was um, put under as brief immersion, and longer than one year were at long immersion, and they participated in two tasks in order to analyze if there were variable patterns in their clinic placement. Um, I split them up, the L2 speakers into eight brief immersion and nine long immersion. And the average amount of time in Andalusia for um, the brief immersion was 7.5 months, and then 5.68 years for the long immersion. So I did um, really kind of have two nice separate groups there. And then of course they were given an LHQ, that way we were able to establish a proficiency and um, their, um, how they were with their languages. So first task was a memory heavy elicitation task. Um, and so this is kind of a broad look at what each participant saw, and I'm gonna go ahead and walk you through that. So each participant first saw a series of four numbers on the display and was asked to remember them, hold on for, to them for later in the task. Um, on the second slide, they saw a referent picture followed by a recorded sentence. Um, one of those sentences, I have two examples on the top, one being a proclitic, one being an inclitic. Um, let's say they heard a proclitic. Moya la noche, Paula lo va a fuera. In English, it translates to late at night, clitic, it is going to look for outside. Um, Sentence varied in the identity of the finite verb, and the of the referent, and of course the clinic placement. On the third side, they're then asked to repeat those four numbers that they held on to later or earlier, and the referent picture and then a written preamble were displayed on the last screen, and that prompted the participant to repeat that sentence that they had previously heard. So this kind of idea came from, we wanted to know if the participants will repeat um, like they heard, or more in line with the tendencies of the finite verb. So we're currently still coding um, our data for the memory heavy elicitation task. It's proven to be a little more difficult um, to really pull out those clinics from the sentence and making sure that it's not just depending on their, their variety of Spanish or how they're speaking. So we have, we're working with um, a couple native speakers to make sure that's really uh, valid uh, coding. But they are being coded for presence and accuracy of the finite and non-finite verb, um, presence of the correct clinic and clinic placement. I did bring um, along some examples for you guys to hear. So um, we're going to give you an example here, a participant that moves the clinic to pro clinic positioning in an ear ah um, trial, where we know that the DDs um, found that 86% of the time they do favor the pro clinic positioning. So that was, this is here, is what, the, what they heard, and then this is the response that we got, so it was a clinic movement. Este martes, Tomás lo va a comprar en el supermercado. So we did hear that um, clinic moved to the pro clinic positioning. And then we have Podier, which was only a 32% proclitic positioning, and we saw them um, switch this to the enclesis. And that's what they heard in here was the response. Por la tarde, Valentina debe lavarlo con una toalla. So that's just a couple examples. Our second task was an elicited production task. Um, we wanted to see, um, to measure the role of animacy and finite verbs again in the clitic positioning. Um, this time, we just went out wanted to see a little bit more naturalistic um, setting. They weren't being taxed on their memory. There wasn't a record it, recording, so they were just kind of free to click through these slides and kind of just see what they were going to produce. So I'll show you an example here. There's two characters and um, a little preamble with each character and then the referent there. Um, so this one is about Eli and Nico, or and Sophia. Um, they had a pair, and we need to know what they need to do with the pair. Um, so as they flip through the sides, 
um, there's a finite verb and the character. We might hear something like Miguel necesita comerla, they go through Sofia necesito godarla, and so we're just kind of getting more, what are they going to produce right off the bat there. So with that in mind, we do have a couple predictions here. Um, first, with our native speakers, we um, think they will follow previously observed percentages um, from the DD study um, with the chosen finite verbs. Our higher proficiency L2 speakers will show better memory for the sentences than our lower proficiency speakers. Um, our third one is English Spanish bilinguals may show an overall preference for inclusives, like I said before, because en English object pronouns come after the verb, for an example. John is going to buy it after the ver verb, which is most in line with our English speaking. L2 participants who have been immersed for a long time will show more native-like patterns um, than participants who haven't been immersed in Andalusian Spanish um, for as long. So we are still coding, but we do have some preliminary results um, do indicate that the L2 speakers can acquire these variable forms when they are lexically constrained, but um, that early on in acquisition, placement is impacted by their L1, so kind of what we talked about with their preference for analysis. So we're still coding, um, and we do have future plans. Um, we're getting ready to run um, L2 learners who have not traveled abroad or have no immersion, so kind of that Spanish classroom learners here on campus. So um, I really do want to take a minute to thank everybody here. Um, it was an amazing experience to uh, travel abroad. It was something different as, I've been abroad before, but it's something different when you're there for two months and actually kind of feel like you're becoming part of the community and you know which buses to take and you can tell people which direction to go. Um, so it was a kind of neat experience. Um, I do have to thank the CLS. Um, like Maggie said, we have presented um, at the, y, the two, po three posters um, now, and you guys have all been really receptive and giving me ideas and making me think differently and ask questions, so I really do have to thank uh, this community here. Um, the girls that we were in Granada with, Abby, Rebecca, um, and Maggie, we really were goofy girls. We really did have the best time. It was really fun. Um, lots of adventures in Granada, and it was really amazing to work with the lab members in Spain. And then of course, Karen and Cindy, you guys are the best. Um, thank you for your guidance and believing, and Maggie and I, like, it really feels like you guys have become like really good friends of ours, um, and we really just respect you guys a lot too, so thank you. <laughs> and then to Judy and Julie, the Pyre PIs, thank you for all your organization, and we love you guys. And then of course, Teresa Bajo and the members of Lab 13. So thank you. <laughs> And there is time for questions. <coughs> can you remind me? Can I ask a question? Yeah. Can you remind me in the corpus study? I, I, I was distracted and I didn't hear it. Did you say that in the corpus study there are there are preferences for proclesis and enclesis? But what is the is there an overwhelming preference for one versus the other? I know that you talked about the type of verb and so forth, but? Well, when I was reading through it, it really just depends on the verb. So the, we chose six um, verbs from the data, data that kind of had a variety. They were either um, really favoring proclesis, really favoring um, an enclitic position, or there were some that were just kind of in the middle. So that way we kind of had a variability of pulling out which verbs favored which one. So. And do you have an idea as to why these, might, these verbs might pr prefer the clitic to come? before or after? Is there something about their meaning? Um, about as far as me, what I've been researched and been reading, it really, I don't know that we really talk about why exactly it happens, but we just know it's the animacy and um, like we know that they change it depending on the animacy and what. There's some work where there's a paper by Rena, I think, that has looked at it. Um, so things that seem, so overall they always go before finite verbs if you don't have the construction, right? So if you just have one finite verb, it prefers and so when the construction seems like a finite verb, because it's the, the, the finite it gives them more like an auxiliary, like either ah, uh, there's some indication that perhaps that refers to this is because the person is thinking of that as one thing, right? Not as two verbs. Sort of that's one Panerke problem found with Panerke that he didn't get he expected that for Panerke and did not find it. He found more implicit with Panerke, so yeah. Yeah, and I was thinking of the animacy, which we haven't looked at the animacy. Yeah, piece, we keep forgetting that piece of yeah. the mm -hmm. point there. I was, I was, I'm asking because there is a production model that that says that you want to get things that are harder out first. Oh. 
And so I wonder whether the preference for proclasis might have to do all, not only, I mean, it's not only linguistic reasons, but also processing reasons when you want to, when you, where you want to, as quickly as you can, get a whole bunch of information out. Because the more you are trying to say, the harder production is going to get, and you might lose some of that information. So, so it might be one another reason why you might see proclesis more often than, and especially with the memory task, because the mm -hmm. first one, because they are holding that thing in memory, they see the reference, so they know they've got to get that out. Mm -hmm. But we do find over more implicit with the L2 speakers, but perhaps with the native speakers. With right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? That's very good. Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs>